Um, that's, we're moving on now to the second theme that we've got tonight, which is uh, a, a number of questions that have come in around, the, broadly relating to the whole issue of democracy and the democratic process. And, uh, but actually, we felt that two of them would work very well with a, a show of hands, a little bit of audience participation here, uh, a show of hands from your good selves. We've got two questions here that we're very interested to hit, see how uh, yourselves feel about these relating to democracy. Uh, the first one is about compulsory voting, and the second one is about having, uh, altering the ballot paper so that there's a, a none of the above box. So I was wondering if I can ask you, please, if I think I'll have a, a show of hands just to indicate how people feel about these. I'm not going to ask these as specific questions to the candidates. They're welcome to pick up on them if they like. But um, So if I could ask the first question, um, which is, would you accept, yourselves and the audience, uh, the voters of Wickham, that voting should be compulsory. All those who think that voting should be compulsory, could you put your hands up, please? Is anyone going to count this, by the way? <laughs> and uh, those who feel voting should not be compulsory? Hmm. Anybody like to abstain on that one? Oh, that's interesting. What a very opinionated crowd we have here today. Um, second question. Would you like a box on your ballot paper when you go to vote for none of the above? Uh, in those in favour? Those against? Well, there you are. That's very interesting. Thank you very much for that. At least your arms are a bit warmer now. Um, so, coming to the panel, and this time we'll start if we met with David, but we'll follow the same, David Meekock, sorry, but we'll follow the same order. order. We've got two questions here. Um, again, we'll go for three minutes, uh, the first question, and then I, I was wondering if we might have others that have come in from the floor which relate to this subject. I think those all three actually belong with the next. Um, I think those probably all belong with the, the final section. So, in fact, we have two questions for the panel, and you'll get three minutes on each of them. Uh, sorry, two minutes on each of them. Uh, the first question is, uh, Tony Blair in 2005, with only 35% of votes cast, won a 55-seat majority. Parties should be fairly represented in Parliament, and people should get what they actually vote for. The current system <clears throat> is no longer fit for purpose. Can you please outline how you will de deliver a fair voting system? And again, you'll have two minutes each, and David, as the, David Meacock as from UKIP is starting off. We'll also get a minute at the end to, to respond to what's been said. David, do go ahead. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. Yes, um, I think the situation that we've had up to now is that... Um, all over the country, even with a three-party system, has actually been mostly a two-horse race. Um, in the southwest, typically the, the main the main competition, even if there were more than one, even, even if there were more than two candidates um, standing, the main two-horse race would be between the Liberal Democrats and Conservatives. In the southeast, traditionally, most of the two-horse races has been between the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives again. In the north, it tends to be between Labour and the Conservatives, and of course in Scotland, as it has come to very much to the fore, it's mostly, in recent years, been between Labour and the, and the um, Scottish Nationalists. So although you've had more than two parties, in most regions of the country, the, the primary race has been a two-horse race, in which case first-past-the-post sort of works. And it's also given the, the relationship between voting for the person um, who then would represent everybody, whether everybody had voted for them or not. But things have changed, particularly with the um, rise of UKIP. And we, after all, won the first the European elections last year. It was the first election in 100 years, national elections, not won by the Conservatives or Labour. And I think we've now reached in the UK um, an era of multi-party politics all over the place. And so I think, you know, the time is ripe for political reform. 30 seconds. Um, I think, you know, obviously there's the, there's the, there's the uh, West Lothian question where the different regions are still voting on, on English uh, measures that they have, have their own votes on in their own parliaments. So UKIP will definitely...
definitely uh, take measures to give um, English voters, uh, sorry, the English MPs uh, exclusivity. But uh, generally, I think we do need reform of the first-past-the-post system, perhaps a combination between that and the European list system. Thank um, you very much, David. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve Guy, Lib Dem, please. Uh, yeah, well, to, to, to uh, a strange degree, I find myself in, agreeing with the UKIP candidate there, but... Um, He's making yes, progress. I, mean, I think it's become really plainly obvious now that the current system is no longer fit for purpose. Look, if you, you've got first past the post, is a system which favours two parties. So if you go to any country that has first past the post, it tends to be dominated by two parties, and other parties have to work really hard to get any kind of a look in at all. We don't have a two-party system in the UK anymore. It's quite clear that, that there's a, a broader spectrum of opinion and there are more parties that have got important things to say. Now, in the, within the Liberal Democrats, we support a system of voting called single transferable vote, which we already use for all of our internal party elections. We, it's a very easy to understand system and it simply re requires you, when you get a ballot paper, you can still just put an X by one candidate if that's what you choose to do, but you can also rate the candidates preference. You can vote, rate them one, two, three, four. The difference is that then if a candidate fails to get 50% of the vote, and Steve Baker, bless him, did very well last time with 49%, which is a very creditable vote and probably would still have got him in, in as the MP under STV. But it does then force the counters to look at the second preference votes as well. Um, in Britain at the moment, roughly 350 of the 650 seats are considered by most pollsters, most pundits to be safe seats. They're very unlikely to change hands in this election. That means that your vote is probably only worth, according to democracy, 0.15% of a vote. You're not much likely to influence the government in this country. Whereas if you live in a, a swing seat, your vote's worth 10 votes because 10 you're, you know, you're the, you're the ones that can change the system. We'd like STV so that votes count the same right across the country. Thank you very much. Steve Baker, Conservative. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so fair representation is a very, very old cry. Men versus women, um, property owners versus non-property owners, graduates versus non-graduates. I believe in political equality. I think everybody's vote should count the same. And one of the big problems in this country, which was alluded to with the Tony Blair point, is that constituencies are not equal sizes. And there was a huge round, which I'm not going to rehearse now in Parliament on this point. We tried to make the constituencies equal sizes whilst reducing the number of MPs. Wickham, as it happens, would have been about at the right size. I was due to gain, uh, Wickham was due to gain um, Stoke and Church, um, and possibly with a discussion one other. But it didn't happen for all sorts of reasons. But I would like us to, number one, to deliver equal sized constituencies with basically the same number of electors in each. The second point, I mean, Churchill, who went from Liberal to Conservative, um, described this point about proportional representation of one form or another as the Liberal grievance. And a problem happened around the first half of the 20th century as the Liberal vote uh, collapsed as socialism uh, rose. Um, and we could debate the various histories of that. Perhaps some people here are better than I, than I am at it. But um, it's been the Liberal grievance ever since. Now, the truth is, the public, you, were given a referendum, would you like AV? And the public voted no public chose to stick with first past the post and as a democrat you know i campaigned with my party for no to av to stick with first past the post and that is the system that we have and it was a democratic choice um, i'd also like to see us having english votes for english laws the prime minister was given the choice and he's chosen for the conservative party to have an extra stage in legislation so that on english only matters seconds. English MPs can veto legislation. I think that is a good thing, and I would like to deliver that. But the thing that um, is really important in our democracy is we really should have a referendum on our membership of the EU. It's fundamentally undemocratic that the people who voted in the referendum before thought it was a common market, and clearly today it's not merely a common market, yes. and we should have a referendum. And finally, on the, when it comes to none of the above, people do go into the ballot box and spoil their ballot papers, and you know that is an acceptable way, I suggest, of recording a protest. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Jen Bailey, Greens. Yeah, I mean, the Green Party is very much um, in favour of the alternative felt, um, as most small parties, I think you'll tend to find, um, are. Um, it's interesting, it all comes down again back to the in, um, inequality um, that's happening. Since it isn't fair, that obviously the, that's if you have a right to 
to vote and you want to vote and have a choice to actually vote for one of the parties, that you don't really make a difference. Um, it is getting to that stage now that you are, you do tend to make a difference. It's interesting what they say is like, oh, it says all parties pretty much up here use the AV system to vote in their leaders. So if it's okay to actually do their leaders, why is it not to not okay to actually on a on a vote for you guys? Um, if you look, there is a website out there that's called Vote for Policies, and if you do go on that, that website, probably some of you have already, the Green Party, all, and you actually go and vote for the policies that you want and you like, it's always the Green Party that is up there, because people choose the policies that actually make a difference to them, and you do have a choice for that. The only one other one thing I want to bring up is, is it inter is interesting, so obviously the Conservatives are saying that they, they wanted to add the Stoke and Church, it always tends to sort of the constituencies always tend to change to suit the parties that are in power, which is just sort of a strange one, really. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> okay. so, you finished? Thank you very much, Jem. Um, then David Williams, uh, Labour Party, and then we'll have a minute. Uh, I think it's interesting that... Um, this debate's happening at a time when actually your vote is worth more than perhaps it ever has been because the parties are so close in the national polls, um, but also because the parties are so close in the in the local polls because the Bucks Free Press poll showed that, um, that it was a three-horse race in Wickham with UKIP and the Conservatives on 25% and the Labour Party on 26%. So actually it's quite exciting in, in Wickham that, uh, that your vote does count for more than it has done for a long while. Um, but in terms of the, 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 the main thrust of the question, should we say, um, I, I don't think this is about, it's not about constituency sizes. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's playing with the deck chairs while the Titanic's sinking, really, isn't it? Um, I mean, if, if we're talking actually about um, trying objectively to be fair and trying actually to provide true democracy, then I think every vote does have to count the same. I, mean, I may be out of kilter with my own... Um, party on this, but I do think um, that proportional representation really is the only w fair way of providing democracy. Um, I mean, I think there are other things that you can do which would improve uh, the democratic process, um, at the, e even as it stands now. I mean, de devolving power to uh, uh, more uh, regional and local areas is one way of doing it, so decentralising, which is one thing that we would like to see. I think secondly, reform of reform of the House of Lords to, to make that uh, more democratically accountable and elected. Um, and I, I think for my part, and it's a bit of a pet project really, it, it's a, a much more uh, locally democratic system where our, our local politicians, whether it's MP or, or councillors, don't just hold surgery. Ten where, seconds. Don't just hold surgeries where you can go to them if you've got a problem, but we actually report back to you. We have a structure where we report back to you on a regular basis so that we can find out uh, what you want and where we can tell you what we're doing. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. And now we come to... I'll just check my list. Dave, David Meacock, you've got a one-minute response if you want. You don't, uh, don't well, feel obliged. <coughs> well, thank you very much. Um, I mean, we started off talking actually about voting and then we seem to have drifted on to democracy itself. Um, and, it, and I was left thinking actually that, that I think the, the UK has become a lot less democratic in the time that I've been a councillor since 1999. For example, 90% of your planning applications are now determined by delegated powers. So it hardly ever goes to the planning committee that you've elected. Um, and uh, Vivian Redding, uh, recently retired European Justice uh, Commissioner, has said that every single European state uh, has 75% of its laws sprouting from Brussels, to put my own pun on it, which therefore means that if you're having to operate within that framework, just as the motor cars all became looking the same when they all decided to become aerodynamically efficient in the 80s and 90s, that's why there's hardly any difference. And up to now, you've had very little choice, which is why I think in, um, there was quite a low turnout, actually, as two elections ago, the last one. Thank you very uh, much, but um, now you've got a real choice to get your country back. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and then we have a, a second question, which you also have the luxury of two minutes on, um, so somewhat easier than the first round. And this was that um, it's quite simple. Um, if elected, would you choose to keep the Universal Human Rights Act? And we'll keep the same order, but there won't be a right to respond at the end. David, David Meacock, UK. 
Uh, very simply, no. <laughs> um, if we if we exit the if we, when we exit the uh, EU and we intend to take control of our country back, that will also include taking control of our courts back. So we don't have other people telling us uh, that uh, the, the um, what's gone through the uh, English judicial system apparently isn't right and, and can be overruled um, by. Um, other people from abroad, so no, we shall, we shall get rid of that. I mean, of course, we, we're in favour of human rights as a concept in general, but we're not in favour of uh, the European courts telling us what to do. Thank you, David. Uh, Stephen Guy, Lib Dem. Thank you. Uh, it surprises me not that you can object to anything that sprouts out of Brussels in their view. I mean, I, I don't think that, that for most of us, I think human rights are, are a basic concept, aren't they? It doesn't, doesn't matter what country you're from or, or, or what country the, you, the court that rules over it sits in. The actual concept of do we believe in human rights surely is a universal concept. And, and the, the universal um, declarations on human rights, I would like to think that Great Britain would be a world leader in that, not someone that says, actually, I want to opt out of bits of it because they don't suit me. Um, these are just fundamental uh, values, I think, that, that Britain has had over the years and, and the rest of the world looks up to us to uphold them, not try and absolve ourselves from them and wiggle out of them on silly excuses. And I don't really need two minutes to tell you that, so yes, of course, I keep it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Stephen Baker, Conservative. This is a subject on which I've listened very closely to my uh, right honourable and learned friend, Dominic Grieve, uh, for Beaconsfield, because, of course, he was... Um, Back from the government because uh, the Conservative policy is to have a Bill of Rights in order to escape from the case law, because I think the, the Conservative view is that, of course, we support the, the, the substance of the Convention rights, but with a sense that we're not content with um, the case law. So there's going to be quite a considerable debate, but the party's policy is to have a Bill of Rights which um, achieves the substance of those rights in British law, but which brings us out of the... Um, uh, the case law and the, juris, uh, the jurisdiction of the, of the particular court. Of course, it's under the Council of Europe, not the European Union, which is an important distinction. Um, I'm going to listen extremely carefully to the arguments. Um, I want us to ensure that we are always a beacon of the dignity of human rights to this world. I think we have been for a very long time under our common law. I think it was largely not for our sake that that convention was put in place. The United Kingdom was a great defender of rights in the circumstances that led to the Convention's establishment, and I think we've got a very proud history in our common law, in our Magna Carta, in our uncodified constitution of defending rights, and I want to ensure that we continue to have a first-class reputation for it. But there is an issue with case law and the public reaction to that case law, and members of Parliament's ability to vote in ways which reflect the democratic of will of the public, for example, on votes for prisoners which is a subject of contention, but is one where, actually, we should be able to decide on votes for prisoners within Parliament. So it's an area where I need to look extremely carefully at the arguments. I'll listen very carefully to Dominic Grieve, and I look forward to the debate. Thank you very much, Steve Baker. Uh, Jen Bailey, Green Party, please. Um, yes, of course, we, we support the um, Human Rights Act. Um, I mean, as, as part of... Obviously, the UK is. We were just the main bit to actually ensure the UK companies operating abroad respect those rights, which is the main thing, and the, the environmental standards that are put in place through that. We also favour, apart from that, bringing some of it back down to the local level. So, simple answer is yes, we would support the Human Rights Act. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, we're making up some time. We'll be able to squeeze some extras in later. That's excellent. Um, right, well, now it's time then to move on to our third topic. Do I, do I, do I get it? Oh, David, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I, did that to Jen. I told you this was too complicated. I, I, I did it. No, no, I did it to Jim earlier. At least I'm being evenly handedly unfair. Um, David Williams, Labour, please. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, the She's Human right. Rights Act is is something which uh, I deal with day to day in in the work I do, and I think it has been such a valuable act, um, and it has been so badly maligned um, on very, very, um, for very little reason, um, it's, I think it's a dreadful shame that uh, the Daily Mail has, has got it into its head that, uh, as, a, as a pet hate, um, and 
Ireland is maligning the European Human Rights Convention and the Human Rights Act itself. You know, go back to the roots of democracy, Magna Carta, um, the right to jury trial. You know, England is the birthplace of these sorts of rights. You know, America, for instance, looks to Europe and looks to Britain, and it's absolutely astounded that we're taking this, this attitude to sort of fundamental human rights. They just don't understand it. They think Magna Carta and the European Convention are fantastic. Um, and they can't believe that we're, we're in the position we are. Um, I mean, it's uh, again, it's, it's, uh, it's on a, one of these other lies which gets ra halfway around the world before truth gets its pants on. The European um, Court of Human Rights passes very, very few decisions which have any impact in terms of overriding our law and where it does. And in one case I did, a transgender case where after many years of trying, uh, the European Court of Human Rights eventually said, well, England needed to kind of catch up with the, the trend across Europe of, uh, of treating That's transgender sense. people equally. And, and that was absolutely the right thing to do, and England changed its law accordingly. Uh, but I think there's a much bigger dimension to this. I mean, it, it, you look across Europe, you look across the world, it's a very unstable, dangerous place. There are still a lot of countries where appalling human rights abuses take place. Ten seconds. And is England... Uh, who drafted the European Convention on Human Rights to withdraw? We're to withdraw? What sort of message does that send to every other dictator um, or other uh, uh, totalitarian government, or even not a totalitarian government, but a government who wishes to suppress the press? Thank you, David. Thank you very much. What message does that send? <laughs>